press record. Hello. So my name is Verena Roberts, and I work with Palliser Schools in Alberta, Canada. And uh, I am introducing today the great Dr. Lee Graham, who I've worked with on numerous projects now. Um, but the great thing is Lee and I met on Twitter, and I don't think we have ever met face to face. Have we, Lee? No, we have not. <laughs> no, I mean like in the same room, but we have Google Hangouts regularly. Um, but we've become yes. uh, partners in crime in research. And oh, there we go. We'll just come back. And what intrigues me most about Lee is her expertise in literacy and how she has integrated it in such amazing ways in online and blended learning environments. So today we are going to discuss how and discuss and examine how can teachers effectively effectively address the literacy needs of learners in online and blended environments. We represent the Canadian e-learning network. Which you seem to have deleted from those. The Canadian e Learning Network. Let me see if I can just jump to those slides. There we go. Can we see that one? Um, nope. Now we'll follow again. Thank you. Um, oh, so this is right at the end. The Canadian e Learning Network is the online blended and e learning association from across Canada. Okay, so now we're going to head back. Thank you. To Gamify. And um, we're going to do things a little differently in this webinar, aren't we, Lee? Yes, we are. Are you there? Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to encourage participation. So the, we need you to tell us where you're from and why you're here. But chatting in the box works, but we want to know if your microphones work as well. So we're going to start at the top, and it's Dawn who's at the top. I want you just to test down your – no, Randy's already get, checking out, aren't you, Randy? He's checking in a car. But Dawn, do, are you able to chat on your microphone? Does it work? Can you tell us where you're from? If you can't, you can just write in the chat box. This is a way for us to know who can actually use it. Oh, he's checking his microphone. Dawn, can you – oh. Oh, he's on. He's chatting. Need to turn on the mic. Oh, that's so you just have to click the talk. Yeah. There, okay, so he's going to check his microphone. I know now we're testing everyone. Okay, so Jacob, you're next. You know you've been next. You're next. So can you test your mic? Absolutely, Verena. I'm doing wonderful today. <laughs> it is uh, actually kind of sunny for a change. Absolutely outstanding. We will definitely encourage you in our – oh, where are you from? Sorry, where are you from? A hop, skip, and a jump from you. I'm in Lethbridge. I thought you were. I thought – yeah, I was that sort of – okay. So good. Not too far from me. Absolutely. I, oh, yeah, I'm from Calgary, Alberta. I forgot to say that. And next, Joanna helpfully put in Kelowna. Joanna, can you test your mic to see if you can talk? Oh, she's got to check her mic. <laughs> Laurel, you'll, you'll be next. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. I'm Laurel Beaton, and I'm uh, in Brooks, Alberta right now, which is very cold, minus 20. And I work for the Alberta Distance Learning Center on sort of a variety of projects. And right now I've been focused on curriculum and curriculum redesign in Alberta. Thanks, Laurel. Um, and, and it's not Wonderful. a problem if you, yeah, if you can't talk to it. I don't want to make people feel excluded, but uh, we are definitely going to model flexible learning today, so we'll, you'll have to chat more in the box then. That'll be it. Now we'll go back to Don to see if his mic is working before I forget him. Don, is your mic working? Click on top. Oh, he's going to type something. Not yet. Okay, we'll keep going. Melissa, you're next. Can you click on the microphone? Oh, she's going to write something. <laughs> the mic be ready. You know I'm coming. <laughs> My mic is not connecting. Okay, Melissa, you just tell us when uh, you think it might connect. Mike, do you want to try your mic? Is Mike still there? 
Okay. We'll go on. Maybe Mike can come in in a bit or you can type us a message. Now, I'm curious, N-S-E-E-C-D, who is that? Can you test your mic? Oh, Mike's now writing something. Oh, yeah, there we go. I had to hit the talk button, I guess. Excellent! Mike, this is Mike. Uh, Yeah, so this, hi, so I'll go, this is Mike, I'm in New Brunswick, and I look after the uh, our online program. I'm, I'm in the curriculum branch at the department, and I look after our online program of uh, 11 and tw grade 11 and 12 high school courses. Thanks, Mike. I've actually I've met you before, haven't I? Wonderful. Uh, yeah, yeah. A couple names here I recognize. Yeah. Now back to N S E E C D, which I don't recognize. Are they there? Is someone there to identify themselves? No. <laughs> and you can type if you if you can't speak. Yeah, you can type. There's no need to be shy here. Um, and Sue, do you want to introduce yourself and test your mic, please? Sure. Um, my name is Sue Taylor Foley. I'm guessing the NSEECD is the Nova Scotia um, Department of Education and Early Childhood Development is one of my colleagues um, who's also online in another part of the building. Um, because I'm also with that uh, entity, and uh, we operate the Nova Scotia Virtual School, which is a provincial uh, school that has three uh, mandates. One, to provide high school courses for students in grades 10 through 12, um, to also utilize those resources for professional learning for teachers, and to also distribute uh, digital resources and online uh, resources through blended and online opportunities for all students. Thanks, Sue. And Sue also helps with the webinars with County Learn. Okay, and um, Diane, do you want to test your mic and see if it works? Or you can chat just in the chat box if it's not working. Oh, she's going to chat in the chat box, I think. I'm doing two things. Oh, you just click on talk, <laughs> the microphone. Underneath the name at the top. Aha. Uh -huh. This is Dawn. Can you hear me now? It's there. Yes. We can. <clears throat> Hi. Pleased to join you from uh, Manitoba. I'm, uh, as I say, focused on adult learning, and I'm very much interested in um, essential skills and literacy, and I'm becoming more and more interested in uh, the literacy of uh, digital technology and uh, quite interested in the idea of uh, PIAC and that whole idea of uh, problem solving in technology rich environments. Wow. Welcome. Welcome. So we hope we help you solve some of those problems today as well as helping you solve, I guess, getting ready to solve the problems with, with your students. Um, and Diane, I just want to check, I don't want to miss you if you just click on the microphone right underneath my picture here. I think maybe that would help. You see that? Can you hear me now? Yay! Please introduce yourself. <laughs> oh, this is a good question. Diane, you can introduce yourself. Sorry, I tried. Um, I'm Diane. I'm a uh, principal for online learning with Learn in Quebec, and uh, glad to be here. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Diane. Okay. So I think I've tried to introduce everyone, and please don't feel like I'm excluding you. Chat away in the chat box. I know um, the great thing about working with Lee and, and working on our own projects um, is that we encourage as much participation as possible. The format for this webinar is not going to be Dr. Lee Graham telling you how to integrate literacy in online and blended learning environments. Um, we want to first have a discussion, and we've got some guiding questions to frame our discussion based on some things that you're currently doing or you've heard about or you'd like to see. And then at the end, Lee will guide a more focused discussion on what her research has provided and suggested and also some projects um, that she's been working on to integrate literacy in online and blended environments. But we want to start first with what currently going on so that Lee can respond to it and give you some better ideas. So 
So I just, now if, if, if I may jump in just before, just to help folks out in the webinar as well, and this applies to those also who are watching the recording. Uh, that's a little foreboding. And uh, you, all of these windows can be moved around. You can go to View Default Layout to snap them back in. But if, because we're going to do a lot of text chatting, you may want to drag the chat box over to the side and resize your uh, whiteboard window a little bit just so you can see a larger uh, listing of the chat. So just left mouse click over top of the top of the actual window on the very top of the bar uh, where it says chat supervised. Just drag it over to a place that's comfortable and convenient on your screen and resize the other collaborate windows and play around with it as well if you'd like. So that will make the chat much easier to see and you'll be able to scroll better uh, over the chat as it comes firing at you quickly. Thanks, Randy. That was Randy Labonte, who I didn't let introduce himself. So can you say something quick, Randy, so you're not just a voice? I'm the I'm the voice in the car. You're seeing this in the roof. <laughs> yes, I'm yeah. Randy Lynn as well, and happy to be here. Looking forward to the session uh, in Victoria right now. Okay. Thanks, Randy. Okay, Lee, I will turn it over to you. And we're we're trying something new, so we'll help we'll help you out, Lee, as we go here. Okay, so so I'm going to just start. Well, maybe I'll give a little background. I'm Lee Graham. I am from Juneau, Alaska. I teach uh, educational technology uh, at the Masters of Education in Educational Technology here at the University of Alaska Southeast. Um, and I have uh, I started life as an English teacher. So I taught sixth and seventh grade English, and I taught reading. Um, and I've taught reading in the uh, university setting. So I come from a background in which traditional literacy was very, very valued. And of course, it's still very important to me. I did my master's thesis on uh, HyperStudio, if you guys remember HyperStudio, HyperStudio and literacy, and how interacting with HyperStudio could enhance literacy. So my research has really evolved uh, over the years uh, as, as we've moved on and we've gotten into, um, you know, we looked at hyperlinks, we looked at web pages. Um, of course, David Jonathan, who we lost last year, but was a wonderful researcher, and I'm not sure that anybody else is doing the work he did on, you know, nodes and the way that students represent their understanding through hypermedia, which was great work. Um, and then on and on and on to Second Life and then finally to Minecraft. So right now, I'm engaged in a project which allows um, 6th through 12th grade students across the world to uh, engage in Minecraft to build literacy competencies and to demonstrate their literacy. And so uh, we're focusing on 21st century literacies as well as traditional literacies. So um, I guess, you know, really the very first question I'd have from the group that it would help me a lot to, to talk to you if I know your response to this is, how do you define literacy? What is literacy to you? And of course, I asked a question that's not on the document, but. So you're encouraged to write that? answer in the chat box or you can speak up if you'd like as well. We why don't we kind of a tough up? question. It is a tough question. Well yeah. Okay, that's good, Jacob. Yeah. Functional communication in a variety of ways and there's so many ways to communicate now. We we talk about literacy a lot as if, you know, as if it's something that's so easily defined, but it's really not, is it? not a binary definition. So not one thing or the other. It's, it's inclusive of a lot of different things. Is that what you mean, Don? Yes, multiple literacies. Encode and decode text. That's Mike, that's one of the yes, that's one of the first definitions that I learned. Um encode and decode text so this could be written or spoken.
Oh, absolutely, Don. Yes, people, yes. Okay, yes, people can lack literacy skills without being illiterate. Very good. As I think about literacy, okay, how to explore, observe, understand the world's cultures via reading, writing, speaking, listening. Observe, understand, analyze, examine. Very good. So you see we've got a lot of different definitions of literacy. Um, so we, we, we talk about literacy, I'm going to be talking about some specific kinds of literacy, but just know that, um, that I'm speaking from my experience, so I'm speaking um, in, the, in the very literal, if you will, <laughs> sense of literacy, which is, you know, encoding and decoding text, um, being able to make sense of written language, um, but also I'm talking about expression. And so I see literacy as a way of understanding expression, regardless of the form that expression takes. And then I see literacy as a way of expressing oneself so that one can be understood. So that's a form of literacy, and it, it doesn't have to be written. It doesn't have to be two-dimensional. Uh, it can be, as many of us have said, multidimensional. And more and more, of course, while literacy and, and expression has always been layered to an extent, we can see those layers a bit more now because of some of the ways we're expressing ourselves. So um, that's sort of where I come from with my definition of literacy. It's about expressing and understanding expression. Um, so then where do we see literacy in online and blended learning environments? There are some really obvious answers to this. So let's let's start with the obvious. Where do we see literacy in online and blended learning environments? What's the one place that generally is in pretty much every online class that has an asynchronous or blended element where we might see literacy? You can write on the board as well, if that helps you with bigger sentences than just in the chat. Just thought I'd put that out there. Yep. And you do that by clicking on the A with the lines on it, double clicking and pulling it over into the whiteboard area. That would be fun to write on it. So we're we're creating our own we're creating our own expression of our experience right now. Um, Joanna says she thinks literacy makes her think of a deeper understanding rather than just reading and writing. Yes, we can read write read, write, but not comprehend, and that's a very good point. Um, when we see literacy in online and blended and learning environments, yes, Sue, we think of uh, text probably primarily. Um, the discussion board is one place that I think that we see a lot of literacy, um, or lack thereof. Yes, forums. This is where the most obvious place that we can see literacy in online and blended learning. We can see an interaction between students. We can see students making sense of what they've read and they make that uh, visible for us so that others can react up, uh, to it. So several levels of literacy there in that we're reading, we're interacting with what we've read. We then interact with the discussion board to make that visible and then interact with each other to build on that. So that is, that's one of the more common ways that we look at literacy um, online. And there's been a whole lot of research on does discussion in discussion boards actually enhance um, student expression, student literacy, if your definition is, you know, to correctly uh, encode text, then the question is does the discussion board help students to do that um, I did a presentation a couple of months ago on Twitter and the way I was using Twitter in a class and somebody asked me if it actually improved students' writing. <laughs> what, what do you think? Do you think Twitter actually improves the writing of students? I have no doubt there has been research done on this. 
Oh, you think it does, Mike? Well, I've heard that it does. I've heard it does. I'm sorry, Garena? I just want to know why he thinks that. Yeah, writing is writing. Thought process and key messaging, so yes. It helps you to focus on the... It does that, Randy, if nothing else. Keeps us down, keeps us succinct. Okay, and Joanna, I think you hit on something very important because any time they can write, we think hopefully they're going to be improving because they're writing and writing and writing. Um, and, you know, my thinking is, I don't think really Twitter does help their writing skills. I don't know. I haven't done the research. But I don't think that's the purpose for Twitter. Um, as somebody mentioned, there are some abbreviations we use in Twitter. Uh, I think it can ha help critical thinking and expression, but I'm not sure that it helps, you know, translates from 140 characters here to accuracy on a paper. Um, I'm just not sure that that happens. But I, I do not doubt there has been research on that, and I'm, I'd be happy to be proved wrong. It's just my hunch that it doesn't, um, mainly because it's about communication, not about uh, a sort of finished writing that often we like to measure. That doesn't mean Twitter's not worthwhile. It's entirely worthwhile. Absolutely. I would not exchange Twitter for my weekly, you know, discussions that I have with my students because it it meets the need, as Don says, fitness for purpose. But uh, I, I'm not expecting that to translate to better writing on papers or blogging. Um, so there's been a whole lot of research done on the impact of using a discussion board on student writing and uh, student expression, and we've seen some of those results that, you know, the discussion board does help if we design it to help, if we're actually measuring that and having students practice uh, formal writing every week, at least in an initial posting, that that can enhance student writing. Um, and then the interaction, we see that it can enhance, you know, student building of content. Uh, so if your definition of literacy is that we are both reading and writing and then ultimately synthesizing and creating a whole from this, then discussion boards can help a great deal. Um, so those are the, the obvious places. Someone said multimedia. And absolutely the use of multimedia in online and blended courses can be uh, a form of of literacy. So how does that play out for you? If you use multimedia, how is that a form of literacy online? What do we want students to get out of that? Feel free to use your microphone. I know some of your microphones work. I heard them. Okay, yes, videos are a way to, to deliver the information, so the way that they hear it, the way that they interpret it, it is a form of expression as well, more and more now. What about storytelling? Storytelling, Lee, and also like in Alaska, just the whole emphasis on oral literacy as opposed to text all the time? Maybe that's where I was going with that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's, you know, when we look at blended and online environments, we get very dependent, and I'm actually having this discussion right now at a university I teach with, we get very used to the way we're doing things. And so to some of these professors who've been teaching for 12 years or so, using the same discussion boards, they love those discussion boards. And they don't want to give up these discussion boards because we know that these typed discussions do what we want them to do. But what if we could do that better? What if what we could say is you can make a video instead of posting on the discussion in a written format. You can respond in video using screencast-o-matic rather than writing. 
I had an excellent student, but I didn't know he was excellent because he wasn't a very strong writer. And so I just sort of had a perception of this student I'd never met as, you know, kind of middle of the road, mediocre, tries, but not, not really anything, you know, he never really produced anything outstanding. And then one day I said, you know, use video, do video blogging instead of regular blogging if you want to. All of a sudden I saw a whole new side of the student. He's a comedian. Not only is he a comedian, he's an entertainer. He's a natural entertainer. And his thoughts are very, very organized. And his passion is very apparent when he speaks his words. So if the objective is not to measure written communication, then in text, then why not allow it to be video, allow it to be a different form of expression since we can do it now. So I love explaining everything. Even with uh, lower grade students, that is a wonderful app. And I use explain everything to give feedback to my own students in an online course in um, curriculum design. So they they submit, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three of their UVD plans, and I speak and write on their plans and send it back to them. It's a very effective way to give feedback to my students. So that's one way that I use it to, you know, enhance their understanding of what they need to do better, and it just doesn't take a lot of time. So it's, um, it's really a nice way to give feedback. And Jacob, yes, it is, and, and that's what I saw with this student. I just saw an amazing entertainer, an amazing, engaging speaker. And, and it's interesting that online learning allows us to release those creativities, but then sometimes we just feel so attached to the way we've done things, we can get in a rut, even with online learning. So um, I think that encouraging our faculty uh, providing and being role models for faculty and using different forms of literacy, um, allowing students to demonstrate the literacy, uh, or rather the competencies in the way they are most literate, can, can be very helpful. Now, as I framed this discussion, I wanted to frame it around Louise Rosenblatt who is an important philosopher, a theorist, rather, in, uh, in literacy and in reading instruction specifically. And Rosenblatt says that reading is a transactional task. So when we read something, we actually interact with the concepts in that work. And the way that we interact with those concepts is different from person to person because it depends on our prior knowledge, uh, it depends on our, our personality traits. Um, it, it depends on our life experiences. It just depends on many different things. Uh, so every person who reads a work will come away with it with something completely unique. And to me, this is where uh, Minecraft specifically is very important with reading. Um, the project that I'm involved in right now, which is uh, Givercraft, and this year we're calling it Survivorcraft because we've added some other works, uh, is an experience that, that really I started with Marina and a group of us working together um, on the Hunger Games. And the concept was that my students who are in-service teachers would come up with the concept of a game that would allow students to demonstrate um, proficiency in standards. So this is actually how it started. Um, I, was, uh, I was interacting with my students on Twitter, but I've gotten to where my students actually lead the Twitter sessions. So it was Seeker, and uh, I had a student who was leading the discussion, and I saw Verena's tweet over here saying, wondering about a Hunger Games experience. And this has been something I've been thinking of for a long time, just because of my literacy background. So in this experience, students actually came up with a concept for a game 
based on the text of Hunger Games. But in what I did last semester, students created a scenario, and I need to put that, uh, Marina, will you put that on the document, the givercraft.com? They created a scenario, and the unit plan is there for the Lois Lowry book, The Giver. And what we wanted to do was allow students to demonstrate their literacy in The Giver through identifying themes and interacting with the text while in Minecraft. So in the first scenario, they are to build the community. Have you all read The Giver? Do you know the book? <laughs> Don't see the movie, read the book. <laughs> I mean, the movie's okay, but it's it's very different from the book. So, uh, so in the giver, initially when you when you begin the book, Jonas lives in this community, and in this community, everything is the same. Everybody has the same birthday. Uh, they celebrate their birthday. All one day, um, you know, they get their food delivered to them, and everybody, when they are, oh my goodness, is it when they're 11? They get uh, jobs, and they find out what it is they're supposed to do. And then they begin training for that, and then they do it. Uh, families are put together to uh, make sure that they're going to be the most socially acceptable family. Once the child has grown, the families are split apart. And once the people have worked as long as they can, they go into the uh, the elder home where elders all live and are taken care of. And um, it, it seems like a utopia until you start seeing the lack of freedom that the people have. You start seeing that, you know, things like colors, anything that is unique and can be disturbing, uh, is taken out of the out of the community. The of course the the problem is that some things which are unique can be uh, bring us joy as well as uh, sometimes bring us um, sorrow and love is one of the concepts that is not in the community any longer um, because love while it can bring us a great deal of joy it can also bring us a great deal of sadness um, when people get old or if babies are born that don't really fit into the community, they're not quite strong enough, um, or they're different, they're released. And it takes us a while to realize that released means killed. Um, so this is a pretty heavy book, obviously. But in the very first uh, scenario, the, the students build the community the way that it is described in the book. And so through that building, we see themes that the students begin to adhere to. And then our, our problem with that became, how are we going to assess this? Because they're building in Minecraft. Um, and we decided that students would take screenshots of the important aspects of their building, and then they would, they would explain it briefly um, when they got into their wiki. Um, Marina, would you share the Mazecraft trailer? Can we play the Mazecraft trailer? I'll, or rather, I'll get I'm the sorry, the Maze Runner. I'll get the link to it, but we can't okay. play a video in Blackboard. I'll be right back. Okay. So then in scenario two, what happens is the memories return. And the way that we do this in Minecraft is we have students create memories in books and spread them across the community. And then other students stumble upon those and find them. And when they find the memory, then they have to build it. And also in this scenario, then weather comes back. Um, all of those dot night and day come back. So we're able to manipulate the world in Minecraft. And this is at a very basic level because believe me, I am no server administrator when it comes to Minecraft. But it's just a matter of turning on the options to let students do different things. And then in the third scenario, where soldiers 
Let's be smarter, more agile, and more deadly than ever before. You are a creator. Can you design the ultimate training scenario? Is your maze as complex as the threat that faces your world? Have you given your trainees the tools they need to survive? How will you design? Okay. <laughs> Am I am I still live? That that was well that was it was okay, Randy. That's good. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show it. And so yes, in a world. That's the classic cliche. But but what I wanted to do was draw students in to um to the story. So uh I wanted them, and we've done trailers for each of our experiences. It is so much fun. And we have a Givercraft uh, trailer that that we've created. Um, I, I wish, okay, Randy, can we can we show the Givercraft one? I just want to, but it's short, um, but it's key. But to me, this is reaching students where they are, where literacy is concerned. This is the type of expression that they are very um, accustomed to. And then to draw them in to the experience. And what we're also doing is modeling because part of what they can do is create these videos to, um, to you know, to demonstrate their learning. Okay, yes. And y'all can click on that link and watch it when you'd like to. Um, yeah, I just think but, that I, that was the second bad experience with tech for me today. I think if I try to web through again, I'm, it's going to be the third time I'll crash the whole system. Oh, okay. We don't want that to happen. So that is the way that we're uh, actually experimenting with using simulations to allow students to explore you know, not scientific concepts or uh, environments in the world, but to explore literature, which is, is very exciting to me. So we're doing it with The Giver, we're doing it with Maze Runner, and we're giving, doing it with Lord of the Flies. It's a free open experience, and we're just bringing anybody who wants to be a part of it in, um, in their classrooms to, uh, to actually participate. So I wonder if you've done some projects um, that you created to promote literacy in your different areas and, and how you did those. Could you share some of those with us? And particularly for online and blended. Don? Don asks, um, are there different ways that students can interpret the book, or did you want to put everybody in the same frame? And um, I think there are many, many different ways that students can interpret the book. I do think that there are some themes that run throughout any book. Um, but we could call those themes different things. You know, we could call it the end of the world, or we could call it, you know, disaster scenario. We could call it whatever we want to call it. But the themes are there. And so that's what we wanted to do was organize and assess to determine whether students demonstrated the, the themes that run throughout the book. And so that's what the rubric's based on. Um, it's, you know, what are the themes and how do you build to demonstrate those themes? And then making inferences from the text, which um, often students have a really hard time with 
But if we say to them, build uh, what the world was prior to this community, then that makes it concrete. Now they've got a place to imagine it, a place to dream it, and a place to do it. I've seen a great deal of inferences being made within Minecraft where it's very, very hard to say to students, what can you infer from this and then get a, get a good answer. A visual bricolage with images in addition to Minecraft. Ah, I see. Well, I think we're doing some work with that this time. Yes. Um, we're doing some work with students are still going to be building in Minecraft, but we're inviting them to do different things with their wiki in addition to taking a screenshot. And we're also differentiating some of the experience. So, for instance, um, we're organizing our differentiation around the Bartle gamer types. So students who are explorers, I have um, students who have built an entire underground world and have maps uh, related to those for the explorer students. And then within that world, um, there are activities related to the giver that they do. Um, I have uh, one student who created badges for the way that they post on their wiki so that if they really don't feel comfortable or aren't excited about Minecraft, they can go into the wiki um, and do something to earn a badge. And But the thing is, we had 800 students last year and we surveyed the teachers at the end of the experience. And one of the questions was, to what level were your students engaged in this project? And the responses they could give were highly engaged, engaged uh, somewhat engaged, or not very engaged. And 100% of the teachers said their students were highly engaged. Students love Minecraft. And I think even the ones who say they don't love it when they sit down and play with it, end up loving it just because what's not to love? It's kind of like having a blank sheet of paper to draw on and but except it's a three-dimensional blank sheet of paper. And the kids seem to get the the way that Minecraft controls work, they're they're made to appeal to that age group. So it's why six year olds are much better at Minecraft than I am. Um, I, we did a Minecraft training a couple of days ago, and a woman was sitting there with a five-year-old son, and she was trying to fly, and she said, why can't I fly? And her son said, because you're under the block, Mom. <laughs> yeah, Mom, you're under the block. The block's in the way you can't fly. So it's just made to appeal to children's ways of thinking. Um, yes, absolutely fun for a, a, Greek, elite, a Greek unit. Um, for literacy integration, even creating web pages, um, that's a way that you can demonstrate different forms of literacy, right? Because rather than writing a um, five paragraph essay, for instance, you could uh, uh, write a one paragraph web page and have links to five supporting paragraphs or four supporting paragraphs. So this builds on the work that Jonathan did in terms of nodes. And for some students, the tactile aspect of linking a word or a phrase to a different page about that word or phrase can make very clear the relationship between an introductory paragraph and supporting paragraphs when maybe they haven't gotten that before. And yes, sneak the literacy in, that's a good idea. Absolutely. We don't always have to assess it. Um, but to me, literacy, creativity, expression, all goes hand in hand. And choices, absolutely, Joanna. If we buy Rosenblatt's theory that the meaning that we make of any piece of literature is individual to ourselves and not really replicable by someone else, 
then to express what one sees in that writing is is absolutely imperative. And the way we express it can be many different ways. Uh, infographics. How much work have you all done with infographics and making infographics? An infographic, um, it's, I think you've probably seen them before. Uh, maybe we can put an example of an infographic. I'm going to, so an infographic maker that you could use PictoChart. Okay, there's one. You may have to pay for this one. But there, there are several that you don't have to pay for. But an infographic is a very high level way of expressing your, your knowledge. Very, very high. And you have to cite where you got the information. So the first thing students have to do is research. I don't, I don't blame them, Melissa, because probably it's hard. <laughs> it's very, very hard to make an infographic. First you have to research. Then you have to decide how you're going to put the information together so that it makes sense. Then you put the information together and you cite where appropriate. Uh, so it is an extremely high level task. And I would say that when students create infographics, storyboarding would be absolutely essential because uh, otherwise that it is going to be, if you just say create an infographic, there are so many steps that students could easily get overwhelmed and just whatever. So chunking that task into uh, into different parts. And yes, Don, we must always use our powers of infographic creation for good, not for evil. And so they are persuasive, and very few people will take the time to go and check out those uh, citations that are used. So it's uh, it's, it's a really high-level task. I assign that to my students, and they have real trouble with it. And then what about comics? Um, I have my students create um, blog entries. Thank you, Brina. We had said Lee wasn't going to talk the whole time, but I guess I did. But y'all have been interacting, and so I'm really glad. Um, but I have my students create blog entries every week, and they do an initial entry, which I expect them to get right, and I have criteria for this. It has to be, you know, accurate. It has to um, integrate two resources that I've given to them and at least three that they find for themselves. Um, and then it has to be a certain number of words. And in the differentiation class, I've been requiring them to do one little extra thing. So one week it was an infographic. Um, uh, one week I had them do a video. Uh, one week I had them do a concept map. But then one week I had them do a comic. And they absolutely loved it. They created their comic first. Yes, Pixton is very nice. And then they wrote their blog, and they said for pre-writing, it was just really effective. Um, so using comics, that's a form of literacy. When a student creates a comic that is meant to um, meant to express something, a concept, a, a punchline, whatever the final frame is going to be, that is a, a form of demonstrating your literacy, and it's again sort of reaching them where they live. There are so many students who are into graphic novels. And I, I can't say enough about graphic novels because this is something, at least if you're of my generation, it wasn't given a great deal of credit or, or, or credence. I mean, my graphic novel was the Superman comic book. And you didn't bring those to schools because they get taken away from you. But kids now, a lot of them are reading the manga, uh, the anime that is, and, and then there are some mainstream graphic novels. Uh, this is a wonderful way to allow them to demonstrate literacy. Um, perhaps they use the comics to write, you know, a, a longer piece, which is a, a graphic novel that they publish online. Or for students who are very good artists, maybe you have a drawing pad 
And so they use the drawing pad, and they'll be working on that at home. I mean, my daughter has drawn so she's drawn so many things, and she shares them all online on Deviant Art. But then, you know, she doesn't get to. She never got to do that as part of her academics. So integrating those different intelligences to to demonstrate um, literacy in different ways can be uh, just so empowering to students. Marina, I've nearly talked my voice out. I know I can hear your voice. So <laughs> I was just going to say, if anyone has some questions, and Joanna, Jake, maybe Jake, could you want to explain storyboard that a bit? Are you there? Oh, he's writing. I know we're not good at talking. We need. Oh, there he goes. Well, that's the way it goes, right? But anyway, it, it's very simple. It's just a similar idea to the comic book item uh, that you shared there too, right? But just a chance to put postable characters and props and scenes and uh, build an idea. And so we're doing it as a as a at, towards the end of our workshop as a part of the revision process, um, so that they could actually see their story arc and better align that to something that works. Um, but I can easily, using it in the beginning, right, is a great way to uh, generate ideas and maybe flesh out what you want to write before you actually sit down and put words on paper. So, and it was just handy for our group because we already have Gmail accounts, all the students, um, and you can log in with your Gmail account. Thanks, Jacob. Another great project, but I think you you did say one really good point at the end there because it's it's sometimes it is about the tools, but sometimes it's hopefully often it's not. But it is important that everyone has access to the same tools, especially if you're doing something together. Um, and um, what you're suggesting is everyone at least had the access to the tools. So look at what you already have within your district. <laughs> <laughs> Always what I say first. We are already what you can already ask us. Um, I just like to say thank you to Lee. If anyone has some questions, Lee, do you mind uh, typing in your email or um, your contact? Oh, someone's talking. Is that Lee? Are we at, okay. If anyone has any more questions to Lee, for Lee, please uh, do not hesitate to send her an email. And she is looking for participants for her next, uh, uh, it's not it's not Maker, it's SurvivorCraft, they've changed names, so I've got to get it right, SurvivorCraft Project, so please look online for that one. Actually, did I put that in? I don't know. But thank you for coming, and um, we look forward to seeing you at future Canny Learn webinars. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.